This is uh, the GAA's seventh webinar. We'd like to thank COVID for our silver lining in this, that we all get to talk to one another in an online manner and get to reach people that we haven't been able to do, to do so before this. Um, I, my name is Catherine Wyatt. I'm the Federal GAA Publicity and Marketing Officer. Tonight, I'll be hosting Gary Holloway, which we'll talk about in a minute, and Sally Lyon is our other wonderful co-host. Sally is one of the fairest and brightest educators up in Brisbane. She teaches both the gemology and intro courses and a couple of others. Sally, what else do Opal. you do? Opal, I've been doing Queensland Opal. You've been doing a lot of, yes. say again. The Queensland Opal was very well received. So if anyone has an interest in Opal and you're in Queensland, please keep an eye out. We'll be running some more this, this year. And you had a lot of intro courses last year, at the end of last year when you could open. Yes, up until and including January this year, we had seven across the space of three months. It was awesome. That is very impressive. Mm. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the intro course is about 10 to 15 hours, depending on your state, and does all the basics of gemology. So you get to learn about the instruments, um, and I should probably, you should be probably giving this introduction to what the intro <laughs> course is. You do lab equipment, you do ornamentals, you do synthetics. Uh, in Queensland, we break it into two days. The first day is a lot of the theory. So we try to condense down most of the theory that you would otherwise learn in Gem 1, but, you know, obviously simplified. So it's understandable, but it gives you a taste of, um, of what is involved you know, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of crystallography and so on, a little bit of the science. Um, and then the second day we get people to actually test their own stones, which usually gets everybody quite excited. Um, and it's great that we get people who can pick up interference figures on Polariscope. They can do RI readings after a day and a half of doing gemology and fabulous. Excellent. It's a lot of fun. I started off that way too. Really enjoyed it. There are lots of other short courses you, you can do in all the states. There's everything from antique jewellery, pearl threading, um, synthetics, inclusions, just as classes just on inclusions, there's classes on yes. crystals. And each state has slightly different ones. So please go and check out the website, www.gem.org.au, to have a look at all the different short courses in your state. Hmm. That's very important. The other thing is very important is actually, if you didn't know this, all the gemologists out there, you're our best advertising. Your word of mouth is the best way to spread the word about the GAA. So please talk to friends and colleagues about how much gemology has enriched your life, hobby. And there's, there's a lot of hobbyists out there too, because it's an ever, ever growing, you're ever learning about gemology because it's one of those sciences that's continually changing and we're always learning. Mm. Uh, so we're up to quite a few, so we're up to 127. So let's might take it off from here. Okay. Um, so just to repeat that housekeeping, if you've got any questions to Gary, please put it in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please engage with one another in the chat box and you can chat to one another and chat to um, Sally if you've got any questions. And along with all the short courses and other courses that the GAA do, we've also got the GAA shop. So you can purchase anything from kits to um, diamond detectors to synthetic diamond detectors. It's a really good shop and there's got books on there and you can just order it from us online. And plus, if you're a member, you get a 10% discount. Yay! For those not familiar with Gary, he's actually always been very generous with his time for the GAA because he actually used to teach the Diploma of Diamond Technology. And I think, Gary, you even taught me. I did, Kate. Yes, that was back in the I, 1990s. And I did the course with your mother. You did gemology with mum, of course. I, I did the diamond course with your mother. Really? Yeah. 
Mum did that well into her 50s. Yes. Oh, excellent, of course. I thought you did gemology with her, but you did no. diamond tech. Of course, yep. Oh, that's... Uh, and Ronnie Bauer. Mm -hmm. That brings a smile to my face. Not as good as your smile, but getting there. So Gary's also an avid bicyclist and caravanist. He's been caravanning around the world, picking up gemstones, but he started out as a geologist. Uh, Gary, I'm always curious. I'm amazed at how many geologists have actually become gemologists. What's well, the well, when I did the course, it was a two-year course. Um, there weren't as many complications at that, in that time. And um, geologists got a one-year exemption. And oh. so there was a bit of a lull in geology when I did the course. Um, most of my friends who had graduated were camp cooks and tyre changers and whatever, you know, working for geology organisations for prospecting. And um, so there was actually five geologists um, in my year and we all got um, credits and distinctions. In fact, um, I won the Sutherland Award. Oh, congratulations, well done. It's mm. very impressive. Um, so Gary is also a diamond technologist and he's also a registered valuer with the National Council of Jewellery Valuers. He was on council last year as well as teaching the diamond diploma. He became interested in diamond cuts and that led to a whole new career just in diamond cutting and led to his uh, interest worldwide leaders in diamond cutting and now he's with a group of leading worldwide diamond cutters. I'm not saying that very well, but they provide a lot of information and tools for the average person to find a diamond that has the best cut. And that's what we're really all about. If we want the bling, we're buying diamonds for bling. And so Gary's your man to explain all about the diamond cutting in the naturals and the synthetics. So take it away, Gary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kate, for that lovely introduction. And here we go. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, when I first saw um, a lot of lab-grown or synthetic or man-made diamonds in uh, Vegas a couple of years ago, um, <clears throat> I took my ideal scope, this little thing, and checked them all out. And to my great surprise, most of the larger diamonds that I looked at looked really good. Um, much better than most natural diamonds. So I think that there is a big risk and that's why I'm um, introducing a cut as a topic to do with lab-grown diamonds because <clears throat> I think this is something that people have yet to notice. So we're going to go through the cut grading history of how labs started grading cut because they didn't always do it. And I'm going to use my two tools HCA and looks like, and I'm going to demonstrate that lab-grown diamonds tend to be cut shallower. And so if you're dealing with them, you might want to know what's too shallow. So <clears throat> that's why we're going to be talking about lab-growns or man-mades or synthetics. Um, it depends on where you sit in the market as to what you call them. Um, it's the same thing the other way around for natural diamonds, or if you're selling and focused on lab-grown diamonds, you're going to call them lab-grown, even though they're made in factories, not labs. Um, and you're going to call natural diamonds mined diamonds because you don't want people to be thinking about um, natural diamonds as being nice. You want people to think that they're really bad. So... <clears throat> So we're going to be talking about the morphology of rough diamonds, whether they be man-made or natural. So one of the poll questions that you've got there is, do you think synthetic diamonds are bad or do you think that they're good? Me personally, I think that each of them has their place. I think natural diamonds are going to become rarer and more expensive in decades to come. Now, most people are saying natural diamonds are going to get cheaper. My contrarian point of view is based on the fact that many, many mines that will be discovered in the future 
that would have gone ahead and would have resulted in mining of diamonds won't in the future because at least a half the value of diamonds that come from any mine are very low grade. And that half of the value is going to be really knocked about by low cost lab grown synthetic man-made diamonds. So this is, um, this is a view that I hold quite strongly and I've done a lot of thinking and research into this. Um, Argyle mine, for example, which is just closed, um, Argyle would never have gone ahead, and I've had this discussion with the man who discovered it last Tuesday when we had lunch, um, Ewan Tyler, and it just wouldn't ever have gone ahead because the average value of the rough was about the same price as the average value that lab-grown diamonds are going to be. <clears throat> Personally, I'm only ever going to be selling natural diamonds because that's my business, um, and I do see that there is an ongoing basis for people who are specialising in high-end, good quality diamonds. So I am biased. Um, I make no pretense about the fact that I'm biased, but I am also appalled at the misleading marketing that I'm seeing going on from the huge amounts of money that are being poured in to the market by the lab prime companies. <clears throat> so here I have a little telephone. And that's my granddaughter's telephone. Um, cute, isn't it? Very pink. Oops, I've gone too far. <clears throat> this phone doesn't have what your phone has. Your regular telephone has stuff in it that almost certainly comes from the Congo. The Congo is the place where all sorts of rare earths are found. There were some geological um, events that happened that led to huge deposits in thin layers right across the Congo of all sorts of things, including coltan, which is an ore that is mined for tantalum. And it is in all of your telephones, it's in Tesla cars, it's in all of the things that people think um, are going to save the planet. But to get it out of the ground, is exactly the same process as the people in the Congo who are forced often with guns to their necks. Um, they're forced to pan for diamonds. They're forced to pan for coltan. The coltan smuggled out of the country. The diamonds are smuggled out of the country. The Kimberley process doesn't have anything to do with the diamonds that come from the Congo. So the democratic joke, Republic of Congo, is the only place that I know of on earth where there is coercion and conflict diamonds. You could argue that the same thing is going on in Zimbabwe, but that at least is controlled by a government, not a nice government, not one that we like, but there are lots of governments around the world that we don't like. So, <clears throat> um, oh, oh, that one wasn't supposed to be there. The natural diamonds in the top left-hand corner, um, uh, most of those natural diamonds are going to be sawn and cut into a big diamond and a little diamond. The little diamond will probably tend to be cut a little bit on the shallow side. The big diamond that will be 90% of the value of the diamond um, will be cut on the deep side because the constraint is the diameter of the diamond. <clears throat> high pressure, high temperature diamonds, HPT diamonds, um, most of those stones, a single diamond will be cut from them. They're called makeables. You can make them in one hit. And most of those diamonds are small because it's not very good economic value to make big high pressure, high temperature diamonds now that we have really effective CVD diamonds. CVD diamonds are getting cheaper and cheaper to produce. Um, HPT diamonds are very cheap to produce in small sizes. So most of the melee that you see around the place <clears throat> um, of synthetic stones is HPHT, and most of the stones that are larger than, say, 30 points these days are tending to be um, CVD diamonds. <clears throat> so um, there's a couple of CVD diamonds there that have got the carbon around the outside of them. 
Here they are, they've been cleaned up. And um, here's another batch. Now, the batch on the left, you will be cutting um, single stones or you might saw them into four sections and cut four diamonds. But the constraint from a cutter's point of view here is the depth of the diamond. If the diamond is going to be maximized for yield, you will want to make the spread or the diameter as large as possible. And so they're going to grow the depth of the stone, the thickness of the stone to whatever the market that they have is requiring. So if they want a carrot stone, they'll grow it to about 3.85, 3.9 millimeters, which will make a slightly shallower diamond than what you would get from a natural diamond where you're making the best economic value. <clears throat> now, if you keep growing your CVD diamond to a thicker and thicker and thicker level, you'll get quite often what you see on the right-hand side. And that is that at some point in time, the manufacturer of the diamond has probably been stopped. They've taken the stone, they've polished it, and they've put it back into the CVD machine and regrown the diamond. But you can see that there's gonna be a grain line right through the middle of that stone. And graining is a really serious matter for lab-grown synthetic man-made diamonds. There is a lot of graining issues around this. <clears throat> There's also apparently a hardness issue. Um, I had a brief chat, email chat this afternoon with Branko, um, who many of you know. And Branko says that he's been told that um, uh, they're a little bit softer. I presume that means that they, uh, the layers aren't quite as well bonded. So <clears throat> we're talking about lab grown synthetic diamonds in a cut lecture. So the CVDs are bigger, more economically um, easy to make in bigger stones than HBHT. So we're going to be talking about CVD diamonds today. It's totally different as we've just seen. And so if you think about the cut shapes of colored gemstones, um, we know, for example, that we have things called emerald cut. Now, why do you think they're called emerald cut? Well, of course, they're called emerald cut because that's what most emerald crystals are conveniently cut into, just as tourmaline crystals and aquamarine crystals, because they tend to grow in long crystals. So you chop them up and you make them into emerald cuts. Sapphires, for example, tend to be cut into barrel-shaped stones. Um, well, a barrel-shaped crystal is cut into oval-shaped stones and cushion-shaped stones. <clears throat> so CVD, the depth, depth is the constraint. Natural, the width is the constraint. Slightly shallower, in my point of view, is better than slightly deep, which is a disaster. And I'm going to show you what I mean as we go through here. So shallow versus deep. Two thirds of the natural diamonds in a very large population that I have access to, two thirds of the natural diamonds, 70% um, of them, um, sorry, two thirds of the natural diamonds are cut round. 70% of those round diamonds get GAA's excellent cut grade. That's not a very strict cut grade. Um, a strict cut grade would say that the top 10% or 15% of diamonds would get their top grade. So I'm not interested in the cut grading systems that GIA and uh, by, by courtesy of GIA, IGI and other labs, I'm not interested in their grading system for this topic. My system, HCA or Holloway Cut Advisor, which I'll go into in bits and pieces as we talk. And if you hang around to the end of the lecture, um, I'll give you a free 25 stone use of the system tomorrow. Um, it'll be limited to one day and there will be a free coupon that you can get. <clears throat> so from a very large population, 26% um, of natural round diamonds get my top grade, that is under two. 78% or three quarters of the stones that are lab grown get that top grade. Now, this is, this is simply because of the shape of the rough. It's simply because of the morphology of the rough. 
Um, so if you look at an average GIA excellent round cut diamond and an average lab grown diamond side by side, and if you're a consumer, most likely you're gonna say, well, the lab grown diamond looks better. Assuming of course, that it doesn't have graining problems and all sorts of other things, but then um, so can the natural diamonds, they can have uh, clouds and all sorts of things. So let's go into the history <coughs> of diamond cut grading. We're going to focus predominantly on round diamonds. Um, I will introduce the AGS system a little bit later too though. So um, mine was actually the first grading system for round diamonds. Um, it's a parametric system, which means that there are lookup tables that I'll explain later. I made a discovery um, from something that I did in the gemology course or the diamond course um, in the mid, mid 80s. I made a discovery that if you make a pavilion angle a little bit shallower, you can have a steeper crown angle. And so what happens is your steep crown angle going up a little bit is compensated if the pavilion is a bit shallower. And so this relationship is around about five to one. Um, some of my associates think it's maybe five and a half to one. Um, GIA think it's about four and a half to one. <clears throat> so in 2005, the American Gem Society um, developed an objective scanning approach. And <clears throat> a year later, 2006, GIA launched its parametric system. Um, GIA allowed other labs to use their system. This was a very, very clever strategy because it meant that their system became the dominant system. So IGI and other labs um, um, have free access to use the GIA system. Um, it's not the sort of competition effect that you would have expected, but it's been very effective for them. In 2009, HRD, which stands for something that I can't pronounce, it's who grand va 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 do 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 something or other, a very strange system that uses depth percentages and all sorts of things, um, <clears throat> and it's hardly worth talking about because today HRD is almost a non-existent grading lab. Um, their specialty is giving SI2 and SI1 to diamonds that GIA would call I1 or imperfect. In 2020, last year, um, I was granted a patent for a system called Looks Like, which tells you how big a diamond should be um, for its carat weight. All of these systems rely on a 3D scan of a diamond. So a 3D scanner, um, there's a picture of one in the lower right corner. <clears throat> There's a little lid just to the left of the base of that screen. Um, you open the lid up, you pop the diamond onto a little stage, close the lid. Um, there's a camera on the right hand side. There is a receiver on the left hand, a light on the left hand side, sorry. And the diamond rotates um, a series, usually 200 to 400 photos are taken, individual click, click, click photos. And from that, a three dimensional model of the diamond is built. And from that three dimensional model, every facet and every girdle thickness and every little bit of that diamond um, is then known. Of course, there are different accuracies of scanners. Um, the most accurate is the helium polish. Um, GIA used this system for round diamonds. It was developed by some friends of mine. <clears throat> GIA took over, as I said, it's by far the largest organization. So they scan the diamond, um, from that scan, they're also able to identify whether they've seen that diamond again. GIA have this very ingenious system that um, Jim Shigley was telling me about that they were developing in the mid nineties. Um, so basically it means that they can identify any diamond that they have seen before based on the carat weight to the umpteenth dimension, um, maybe about the fifth um, decimal point based on the um, <clears throat> the proportions that they get out of the scanner based on its rough color and its rough clarity, because they may not always give it the same color and clarity, so that they can actually pick up and see whether or not you've sent the same diamond back to try and get a better grade because you think that they were a bit harsh. 
So the proportions are entered into facetware software. The proportions are matched to these spreadsheets, um, which are layers and layers and layers of these spreadsheets for various table sizes and for various angles, et cetera, et cetera. And the facetware gives a cut grade. You can use facetware for free by entering data into this little gadget that you can see here <clears throat> online on the GAA website, just search for it. And um, you'll see that the entry only allows you to do things to uh, half degrees for crown angles, whole percentage sizes for table size, and um, 0.2 degree increments for pavilion angle. So essentially GIA copied what I had done five years earlier, um, except that they added the minor facets. So um, you see the star facet here and the lower half or the lower girdle facet. Um, I would have done that and I put it into my pattern too, but um, in order to do that, um, remembering that round diamonds have got a table, crown angle and a pavilion angle, and that's essentially what I use, plus of course the girdle thickness, um, which I calculate rather than you enter. But I do calculate it with math behind the scene. For me to then overlay the star and the lower half on roughly 40,000 data set of HCA um, would have meant that my data set would have expanded to something in the order of about five or 10 million. And I neither had the time or the inclination to do that because there's not that much difference in, in stars and lower halves anyway. So, <clears throat> so that's how a round cut grading system works um, according to GAA. They've also got over here on the right hand side painting and digging. And if you want to know what painting and digging is, um, you might see it about one in every thousand diamonds on GAA grading reports. It's not a big issue. Um, sometimes it can actually be a little bit of a benefit. Most of the time it's not. It's something that cutters do to fiddle around when they've got a little bit of a natural on the girdle and they want to get rid of it, or they're very, very close to exactly one carat, but it's going to be 99.98 and they want 99.99. Um, so they'll paint it or dig it a little bit. So <clears throat> if we look at that um, GIA report, uh, sorry, uh, that GIA spreadsheet, you can see that there's roughly a 5.5 crown angle variation through to a 1.2 degree pavilion angle variation across the axis of the GIA excellent grades. So the E is the excellent, the V is the very good, the G is the good and the F is the fair. There are no pores on this, uh, on this particular chart, but um, the chart continues to lower uh, pavilion angles, lower crown angles, steeper crown angles, and deeper pavilion angles. So if you divide that out, you'll get about 4.6 as being the ratio. Um, a friend of mine, Bruce Harding, who died last year, um, <clears throat> had worked that out um, and published an article in Gems and Gemology in the early 80s. And um, uh, after him, I think I might have been the next person to make that discovery. And we had some wonderful conversations about what it meant. So what I want you to look at now is a very strange thing. If you look at the, um, the total depth of this stone, it says down here, um, when you put this data, you put the 35 in, you put the 58 in, and you shake it all about, you put the 41.6 in, and you put the star and the, and so down here it says that the total depth is 62.9. Up here, it says that the total depth is 63.6. So why is there a difference? So firstly, GIA round the data. So the 15% up here is actually 14.7% down here. And the 14.7 is possibly more accurate. And the 44.5 here is 44.2. So they have calculated the total depth as being 
up here, it actually measures 63.6 because this total depth is the average diameter over here divided into the depth. And so you get 63.6. So that's a precise figure. Everything else there is estimated. So um, GIA have always said in all of their communications that 63% is the deepest diamond that can get their excellent cut rate. So this diamond is 63.6. Now, if we get time, I'm going to show you a much deeper diamond and a trick that um, some very sneaky diamond cutters did. So um, even though GIA have these rules, they use this really, really silly system to come up with ways that diamond cutters can get more money out of each rough diamond. And I'm rather appalled at that because GIA is meant to stand for good things. It's meant to stand for consumer protection. So <clears throat> I'm going to look at, a, at that diamond. 58% table, 35 crown. You can see the 35 crown in the top right there. 41.6 per billion angle. So this diamond is right on the edge of what GIA allows as a deep diamond. Um, it's very much towards the deepest diamond that you could get. If we go back and have a look at that certificate, you can see that it's just over 6.3 average diameter. Now, most people would say that 6.4 is about the diameter that you should expect to have in a nicely cut diamond that had an excellent cut grade. So if you put all of that data into my calculator, the Holloway Cut Advisor or HCA, you can see that I'm giving it a score of five out of 10. That's a pretty average score. It's definitely not something that I would call excellent. And you can see the stuff, the numbers that I've fed in uh, there in the bottom of that stone. And in some cases, if you're going to use it, in some cases, if there is a diamond that is out on the market or that we have seen it um, and had that, that information from GIA directly, um, you can see the GIA report in the lower right-hand corner. So entering just the report has picked up all the data from GIA. But we can't do that all the time because GIA are going to charge you about a dollar for every stone you do if you're a commercial organisation. So RAPNET and organisations like that are pretty unhappy with GIA at the moment. So <clears throat> there's our stone that we were just looking at before. Um, and it's not something that I would be, um, hello, Karina's fly, flying her hands around. Um, so you can see the 62.9 or the 63.6. How did GIA work out a girdle thickness? Oh, sorry, I did get that. I missed something back there. <clears throat> Where are we? There we are. So the way GIA have actually calculated um, this information, they've taken the 14.7, they've taken the 44.2, and they've taken the 4% girdle thickness and added them up and got 62.9. So that's, that's the way their software actually calculates the grade of a diamond. So they don't actually use all of the information that they've got at their fingertips. They actually use rounded numbers, which I think is kind of a bit off. So GIA, the blue area here in this grading system, um, thin, thin will get excellent. Um, thin, medium girdle thickness will get excellent. And thin, slightly thick will get excellent. It will probably not have um, excellent symmetry, but it can still get excellent um, because you can have very good symmetry and still have excellent cut. The medium girdle thickness, um, they don't allow medium and thin together, but they allow everything with slightly thick. And that's kind of fair enough, I think, because um, uh, often if you've got too thin a girdle, it's probably going to be a bit of a problem. Can break. <clears throat> the 
this is again from GAA, um, and this is how they actually measure the thickness of the girdle, because they used to they used to grade the thickness of the girdle a long time ago by looking at it and just using human observation. GIA have been pretty clever in the last couple of decades and they have automated most of the grading processes. I believe that they are now using machines for colour and for, uh, they're working on using machines for clarity. They haven't got there yet, I don't think, from the patents that I've seen lodged. They have definitely um, changed the way they do fluorescence and I do believe that they are using um, different frequencies than we use in the gem lab. Um, the long wave frequency of 365, I'm sure they're using somewhere around about 385 to 390 now, which you should all be using too, because that's the stuff that you can buy with the, just the, the $2, $5 uh, LED lamp, and you get a much stronger re fluorescence reaction from that. So um, you can see the thin, the medium, and that data is showing the valley and the hill. So if you look at the, at the girdle thickness, you'll see that there's a thick part and a thin part. So this is the valley and that's the thick part. Um, GIA call it the hill. So GIA um, do not know how to grade fancy cap diamonds. Um, does anybody want to guess why they don't know? Because I'm going to tell you. Um, when you use a parametric system, um, you have to add all of those parameters into different sized spreadsheets. So I've just put some numbers on the main facets of an emerald cut. And you can see that there are 10. There are more in the pavilion side because there's an extra row of facets on the pavilion. You've also got the keel length. You've got the angles of the corner because they're not always 45 degrees. And you've got the size of the corners. So um, I was trying to work out how big the data field would be for a fancy shaped emerald cut grading system. And I got to somewhere around a trillion and I thought, mm, it's probably more than that. My gut feel was that it was more. So I, I asked a friend of mine, Jasper Paulson, who is a mathematician of some sort, um, some of you will already know about Tolkowski. Um, Jasper did a lot of work on, um, on a website called Folds, F-O-L-D-S. So if you want to, you just Google Jasper Paulson, I'll show you his name in a minute. Um, you can see um, on Jasper's website um, why the table size that Tolkowski said of 53% is wrong. Because when you add a girdle, the thicker the girdle, the bigger the table size should be. And Jasper worked this out mathematically. And he's actually got a calculator where you can play around with all of these things on that website. So this is what Jasper sent back to me. <clears throat> he got um, two with one, two, three, four, 12 zeros. But then he started adding all the other bits and pieces. Um, he used the data that I suggested to him, for instance, on the keel length, 1% um, steps. So he said, well, there could be from, there could be 20, 1% steps. The girdle could be from 1% to 4%, so 1% um, steps, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we weren't even really splitting hairs. We weren't going to 0.1% um, steps because we knew that this was going to be a pretty big number anyway. So, um, I should have put into the poll, what, what do you think would be the number? It's six quintillion. That's 18 zeros after six. That's a pretty big number for a spreadsheet. Um, and I don't know, I'm not a computer scientist, but um, I kind of imagine you might need a quantum um, computer to work out all of the factors that are involved in calculating your spreadsheet. So if that's what GA are trying to do, I think it'll be another century before they actually finish. They've been working on it for 20 years. The American Gem Society, <clears throat> or AGS, um, it's quite a popular 
um, grading report. They run a small lab based in Vegas. Um, quite a popular grading report for members of the American Gem Society. And to be a member of the American Gem Society, you, you're more or less going to be a very high-end retailer. Um, they've got pretty strict rules. You have to do all sorts of courses to be accredited, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they used an objective ray tracing system from a scanned 3D model. So instead of using the report that came from the 3D model, they use the actual model itself and they use ray tracing software. So that system was based <clears throat> on an asset scope. This is an asset scope. Um, and so when you look at a diamond through an asset scope, like that, you're going to see the diamond um, showing all these different colors. And um, that system was invented originally by a fellow in America called Al Gilbertson, who is now a consultant to GIA and is trying to help them with their cut grading system, and me. <clears throat> On the lower left side is a thing called the fire scope. And that was something that got me into this whole game. Um, when I did the diamond diploma course in the mid, mid 80s, um, a lady at the uh, De Beers, who had an office in Sydney at that time, um, who I'd gotten to know, said, well, we've got this gadget here that came from Japan. Um, nobody knows what to do with it. Um, can I send, you're interested in diamond cut, can I send it down to you? So she sent it down to me. Um, uh, a few years later, they left Australia. Um, De Beers have not had an office in Australia because they got their knickers in a knot because they tried to buy Ashton Mining out of the partnership with Argyle and Rio Tinto, who had the 60% share at the time, um, outbid them on the last day of the bidding. And uh, De Beers packed up their suitcase and left. Um, they actually had offices here in Melbourne um, and they were prospecting and they had actually tried to find the Argyle mine and they, they had the area pegged. And um, the night that they, um, that their lease ex expired, um, my friend Ewan Tyler had arranged all these helicopters and had rented all of the four wheel drives in all of the areas in the Kimberley. And um, they went and pegged it at midnight. Cross story, side story. So anyway, <clears throat> if any of the people who are watching uh, have seen this, um, when you take this, this uh, lens off, the underside of the lens had this hot pink circle on it um, from which I developed the portable version of it, the Ideal Scope. We sell these little gadgets on my website called idealscope.com. Um, we've sold thousands, um, I don't know, probably 20 or 30,000 of these little gadgets around the world, um, mostly in America and mostly to consumers, would you believe, because consumers are smarter than your average retailer. Um, sad thing, it's odd to say. But if you do ever get to go to a diamond cutting factory, you'll very often see um, the better end factories. They'll actually have one of these sitting on the, on the uh, polishing benches for the, uh, the brooders and the, the polishers. So <clears throat> this is how this system works because it's fundamental um, to what AGS do with their grading system. So effectively what's happening is when you're seeing some blue in the diamond, um, that's the light that you and your head will be blocking. The red light is the light that has come from all up there, not there, but all up there. And that's usually where the lights are in the ceiling. The green has come from the walls, not much light comes from the walls, or it's come from a window if you're lucky enough to have a window, or if you're outside, of course, there'll be light. So what they did was they put this construction together of, I don't know, a few thousand um, images that they made with my friend Sergei Sivavlenko software, um, a few thousand images. By the way, I use this very same software to develop HCA. Um, so 
they put this together. Now, <clears throat> if you look across and if you know that Tolkowski um, is 40.75 degree pavilion angle and 34.5, so just around about here is what we consider to be the bee's knees, the perfectly cut round brilliant diamond. But if you look in this direction and that direction, you'll see that you've actually got this diagonal line that I was talking about before, the five to one line. And if you look right up here, you'll see that there's lots and lots and lots of red in those diamonds, um, but there's also a fair bit of blue. And these are the shallower diamonds, um, 30 degree crown angle with a compensating 41, 42, um, pavilion angle. These diamonds are actually shallower than these diamonds. And these diamonds down here, they're still very nice. They're very pretty. They've got more fire because the fire is as a consequence of the steeper crown angle. And in general, um, 80 or 90% of the diamonds that have a steeper crown angle also have a smaller table. And in general, the diamonds up this other end of the system, they have shallower crown angles and bigger tables. And that's because they're usually the sawn tops. They saw the diamond off, they cut a smaller diamond out of the top and a bigger diamond out of the bottom. The bigger diamond tends to be very much too deep because the width is the constraint because they can keep going up as high as they like. And the smaller diamond tends to have very shallow crown angle and slightly deeper pavilion, because unless there's a chip at the bottom of the, of the rough, they will be able to squeeze a bigger, heavier diamond out of that shallow piece of rough. So, here's a little quiz question. It's not one of the formal quiz questions, but which is better, the diamond on the left or the diamond on the right? Well, the diamond on the left is better because it's got more red, which means that it's more likely that the light has been coming from up the top where the lights are in the ceiling or where the sun is or whatever. Um, very, very little green light in a perfectly cut round diamond. Um, a little bit of leakage around the outside edges. There is always this little bit of leakage. There's no such thing as a diamond that returns 100% of the light. Closest you'll get to that is a mirror. Um, but of course you'll only see yourself, won't you? So this diamond um, would easily get GIA's excellent cut grade, but would get about um, five out of 10 on AGS. You've got this green light around the outside edge, which means that it's not going to be returning as much light. It will look smaller because it's deeper. The pavilion angle is a little bit deeper. Um, the crown angle is a lot steeper. Um, you can see that if you know how to look. Um, and so that deeper diamond is actually going to look smaller. Same thing here. The diamond on the left is going to have a lot better look than the diamond on the right. You see where the blue is? Um, as you rotate a diamond, it flashes. And so the flashes that you get when you look at a round diamond, you're going to see, if it's perfectly cut, you're going to see a black star. That black star is the star that you see that's white if it's a hearts and arrows diamond. So when you tilt the diamond the tiniest little bit, that black goes through color, usually blue, and then brilliant white, and then a little bit of red, and then it might go black again. And that's what we call scintillation. So we want to have some blue in a diamond. So that princess cut on the left is going to have scintillation. As you move the stone, those blue bits are going to turn white. The pale areas up here on this number two stone, they're all leakage. And this is a lot of leakage here too. Now, all fancy shaped diamonds have more green light and they almost always have a bit more pale stuff going on too. But remember, you don't pay as much per carat for a fancy shaped diamond. So you can have as much sparkle in a bigger diamond than you can in a round. Now, this is a trick. We've got the same thing the other way around. So which diamond is better? 
clearly the one on the right. Um, the one on the left is going to have that horrible darkness that you often see in an emerald cut. Now, um, one of the types of darkness that we don't like, and I don't have one here, but you've all seen it, is in an oval, a pear, or a, mar a marquee. And that's the bow tie effect. So what causes the bow tie? GIA were teaching up until the mid nineties, GIA were actually teaching that the bow tie was leakage in the diamond. And a lot of people still believe that. So what I want you to do is a simple test. When you see an oval marquee or a pair with a bow tie, poke a hole in a piece of paper, don't need a loop, look at the diamond and what you will see is that the diamond will be all white and there will be no bow tie because all of the light is coming from the white paper. And in fact, when you see a bow tie in a diamond, it's you, it's your face, your head. If you want to change the look of the bow tie, shine a bright torch on your face and you'll see that the bow tie goes more or less the color of your skin. So, <clears throat> here we have a diamond calc ray tracing software which is similar to what AGS have used and developed themselves. And I'm rotating the diamond. And at the same time, in the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that there are calculations and computations going on. So this is how the AGS have developed their cut grading system. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. but it's way better than what GIA have done, and it's much more closely aligned to the results that I get in HCA. So you can see as the diamond tilts, you get all sorts of different colors in the asset. So what they do is they basically count the pixels of the green, the red, the blue, and the white. And by counting the pixels, um, they can very simply work out as the diamond is tilted, whether it's a good one or a bad one. Very rudimentary system from a scientist's point of view, um, but it works. <clears throat> so let's get back to the topic. Lab grown diamonds sparkle more than natural diamonds. That's my contention. So again, a quarter of diamonds get my top grade, three quarters of, of sorry, a quarter of natural diamonds get my top grade, three quarters or more of the lab grown diamonds in a very large population that I've had access to um, get um, my top grade. So my contention is that we're going to find lots and lots of people walking into jewellery stores where both types of diamonds are offered and they're going to prefer to buy a lab grown diamond over a GIA excellent cut diamond. So I would counsel all of those people who are still trying to sell natural diamonds to think very carefully about what sort of diamonds you buy. CV diamonds, CVD, most will get GIA, RGA, excellent cut. Um, there were a couple of questions that we saw come through uh, while we were setting up this evening. Um, <clears throat> which labs grade? And the IGI is definitely the largest in the lab grown space. GIA have recently started lab grown diamonds. Um, they held out for a while and they were only giving approximate color and approximate clarity grades, but they are now doing the whole, the whole gazoo. And also GCAL in America, although we're not likely to be seeing too many GCALs, we'll see mostly IGI. Um, <clears throat> you will see on the GIA and the IGI cut grading system, you'll probably start to see some diamonds coming through with no cut grade, and that's because they probably got very good cut. Um, there's a lot of creativity in the lab industry, um, unfortunately. But as I mentioned earlier, you should be aware of graining because it causes hazy milkiness in diamonds, and graining is quite a common uh, artifact of CVD diamonds, of larger um, lab grown diamonds. So the point is that you would not grow the diamond deeper than you needed to. You know how wide it's going to be. 
So you're only going to need to grow the diamond to the depth that you need. I might try to preempt some of the questions that I think I'll be getting, um, because I think people will be probably talking about um, some of this stuff, but I think we must be pretty close to question time. So what happens if a diamond is too shallow? <coughs> um, this is what we've been told, isn't it? This is what we've been taught. Now, all you budding gemologists should know that the pavilion angle of a diamond where the light is going to leak out the bottom of a shallow diamond would have to be below 24.5, the critical angle. Now, um, apart from a few trillions, none of you have ever seen such a shallow diamond. It just does not happen. Um, the too deep diamond, that's rubbish too, because that would have to be so deep that you would actually cut a pear shape out of it. You turn it sideways and cut a pear shape. It'd have to be around 40, 54 degree pavilion depth. Nobody's ever seen one of those either. And the excellent ideal cut diamond, well, that's called a nail head. Um, that's got a 45 degree pavilion. I don't know why people do that. <clears throat> so this is what happens with a diamond that's too shallow. So when you're looking at a diamond, and I'm going to show you, if you bring it closer and closer and closer to your head, it's going to get darker and darker and darker because eventually your head is blocking almost all of the light that's available unless you're a real bright spark. Um, so if I hold it this way and I look towards, so the diamond is facing the light up there, um, it's getting darker and darker and darker until I can't focus anymore. Do we have a bit more time, ladies? Actually, Gary, you're just coming up to 7.59, so we need really to go on to questions. Okay, let's do questions. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, Alexei has asked, what are the best diamonds in the work of pinning or setting in your opinion, CVD or HPHT? Pinning or setting? Mm. While you think about that, Gary, I'll give you a moment to think about that because I forgot to tell people at the beginning, we're going to have a poll now before question and answers. Ah, so mm -hmm. I'm going to put up that poll. But Gary, you illustrated so eloquently why you are such a good educator and an international speaker. That was a fabulous presentation, excellently done and beautifully um, explained. I'll have to bribe you. <laughs> With the champagne. Yes, yeah. of course. So let's just put up that poll. And then I'll let you get to the questions, if mm -hmm. I may, Sally. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, would you like me to repeat that? Yes. Okay. So Alexa has asked, what are the best diamonds in the work of pinning slash setting, in your opinion, CVD oh. or HPHT? Well, I don't think there's much difference in the hardness. Branko tells me there is a slight difference. So setting-wise, they're, they're just as likely to chip as one as the other. Um, I don't think there's much difference from that point of view, but I'm not an expert. I can't tell you for sure. Um, haven't been handling them myself. But um, uh, the main difference is the price. Um, we're going to see HPT smaller diamonds selling. Uh, the rough is, is going to be um, very, very cheap. Um, bigger HPT rough is going to be two, three, four, five times the price of CVD rough. So. They, to, to double the weight of CVD, you only need to make it 20% thicker Okay. for a polished diamond. Interesting. Hmm. So Helen has asked, are all CVD that square-shaped crystal that you showed in your earlier slides? I believe that they make square or rectangular. Okay. Oh, there we are. Um, it's all about the seed, isn't it? It's the base seed. That's yes. where the shape mm -hmm. comes from. So it all yep. comes from a seed that they reuse. And I think you did answer this, but just to clarify, Celeste was asking when you were showing the, um, the ray trace, that was just representing indoor light or was that indoor and outdoor? The ray tracing was asset light. Um, okay, so it's within the machine. The ray tracing, the uh, um, <clears throat> ideal scope and asset are programmed into Diamond Calc software. Um, AGS programmed um, their software with that asset view so that um, 
the diamond looks the same as it does if you look through this little handheld device that I've got in my hand. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and next one, Frank. Could the most popular fashion of round diamonds sold change to a smaller table and a deeper diamond or cut natural diamonds to compete better with cut lab-grown diamonds? Well, you'd have to cut um, natural diamonds shallower, um, not deeper, in order to compete because um, if you want them to look as good, then you're going to have to change the yield that you get. So currently, um, factories are getting close to 48% yield and still getting GAA triple excellent um, from nice octahedral rough. So um, you would have to drop to 42% yield. And that means that the price would go up in order to compete. Or GAA would have to change their standard for something like that to happen. OK. Um Jill has asked if you could please explain a little bit more about the bow ties in the diamonds, marquee cut in particular. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, Jill, if you know what a hearts and arrows viewer is, if you look at a diamond that has a bow tie, it will appear white, just like the star pattern or in the back of the diamond, the hearts, but on the front of the diamond, it would be the same white as the star pattern. The problem with a bow tie is that it doesn't go away. Whereas the star pattern in a round brilliant diamond turns on and off as you move the stone, in a bow tie in an oval pair or marquee, it stays there. It moves the tiniest little bit and it makes the diamond look like it's two diamonds glued together with black glue. Okay. Uh, this is a controversial one from George. How do you think the pricing of synthetics will go over the next five years? A slow decrease as material becomes more available? Question mark. Well, I think there's a whole range of topics around this. Um, <clears throat> the, the largest cost at the moment for lab-grown diamonds, um, I believe, is the grading cost. The second largest is the cutting cost. So if you take away the need to grade the diamond, you'll reduce the price a lot. Now, if you think about it, um, the only reason that we grade a manufactured product individually, one by one, is because we've graded diamonds that way forever. There is no need to grade a well-manufactured product. The beers have made it very clear that they are not going to be issuing grading reports with their light box diamonds. Um, so you've taken away, probably um, in the future, you've probably taken away a third of the cost. And all that time that it actually takes for the diamond to be shipped around the world to different grading labs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so of course the cost of the material is coming down. It's plummeting. It's falling very, very quickly. Um, but you know, they're still burning a lot of coal to produce them. Um, and nobody's going to tell me that the diamonds are being all being made in Oregon. The beers are, are being good. They're, they're actually using hydropower for light box diamonds. But the other organisations in America, especially the one that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is involved with, um, they're lying, cheating. Um, it's absolute BS because 99% of those diamonds are being grown in Chinese and Indian factories. Um, they don't have any factories that are being powered by solar, wind and whatever. And you definitely cannot afford to interrupt the growth pattern because every time you interrupt it, you're, getting, you're adding a graining line. Next question. So that's going to be a monumental shift in the industry, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, you, you, can't, you definitely can't afford to buy back or, or offer any buyback arrangements or trade up arrangements or whatever with, with lab grown diamonds. Um, it's just never going to happen because the price is, is going to keep plummeting for years, if not decades. Wow. What they also Sally mentioned in one of the Branco um, CVD lectures was that 
Indian guy who was a maker was explaining that the actual cost of the unit is say 60,000 and that's amortized over say five years or however long mm -hmm. is, yeah. is major factor at the beginning. And also the ongoing cost, the most expensive bit is the gases that they use. Yeah. Yeah. And getting the high quality of the gases. Wow. Gary, you mentioned a coupon? Yes. So um, just before, just can before, I get back into sharing? Because uh, most people in poll only. Yep. Well, while you do that, can you see only the poll? I haven't launched yeah. the poll. Because anybody, no, I'm about to launch the poll. Let's do the coupon and then the poll. Okay, well, can you let, oh, there we are. I'm, I'm back out again. Okay, um, share. There we are. So <clears throat> um, there is the free coupon. If you've got your phone handy, you can take a picture of it or you can come, well, you, you probably need to write it down or something. The coupon is HCA space GAA 19th of Feb. And um, you'll get 25 free uses. You'll have to go to HollowayCutAdvisor.com. Advisor with an E will probably come up if you put it in Google with an O too, if Google search is still available tomorrow. Um, <laughs> um, sometimes you can enter a GIA number, but it's really only for probably about a half of the diamonds that are um, currently listed or have recently sold. Um, you enter the proportions into this field over here. Um, if the GAA number doesn't work, just enter all of the data there, the length and the width, um, and then you will get a result. So that's what your result will look like. Excellent, guys. Make sure you take a um, you took a screenshot or a photo of that. And I'm going to launch the poll. So this is just make sure what you've actually learned through this. Uh, and we'll have a chat about that and why, why um, launch poll. Here we go. You can move this around your screen so it's not hiding the HCA. Uh, okay, so... I've launched it. It's anonymous. Don't worry. We won't know who's getting it wrong. And it's just really to reinforce what you've learned um, in Gary's lecture. It's an educational tool. It's to engage you as well. So please go through that. Hopefully you can all see it. Can you all see it? Say yes in the chat box if you can see it for me, please. I can't write in it. No, you can't write in it, Gary. Is it just me? Is it, I'm not allowed to. Oh. Uh, sorry. The only one I might have got 100% on in my life. <laughs> I think you've got 100% on a, a few more things. A lot of that, we've got a yeses. There's a few more questions have come in. Do we have time while people are doing the poll? Absolutely. Yep. Gary, are you okay to answer a few more questions? Yeah, sure, far away. So Celeste has asked... Do you think we will, we will ever have industry or public awareness of the environmental costs of synthetic versus mined diamonds? Eventually we will, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> the mining companies are really playing serious catch up. Um, and, you know, um, like Argyle had um, solar, they've been running their, uh, their camp almost exclusively on solar, but they've been using diesel for running other, other equipment. But lots of mines in lots of places um, have really been uh, very successful if they're in hot places. But sadly, um, probably around a third or 40% of the world's diamonds are mined in, well, probably a bit more than 40%, are mined in very cold places. Um, they might have a lot of sunshine in the middle of summer, um, you know, 23 hours of sunshine in the middle of summer, but in the middle of winter, um, uh, it's very, very cold in northern Canada and it's very, very cold in northern Russia. Um, so <clears throat> they can't do that much about their energy use, so they use a lot of diesel or a lot of gas. Um, but the, the lab-grown people are very opaque about um, where the energy comes from, where the product comes from, etc. So um, I think we've got a long way to go 
for both sides to actually supposedly come clean. Do you think it might be a little bit like the electric cars? Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, but they're not necessarily. Well, you know, the, the, the same argument with electric cars. Um, <clears throat> um, there are a lot of rare earth metals go into an electric car. Um, a lot of pollution created from those rare earth metals, both now and when they're disposed of in the future. Um, there's, there's arguments on both sides. Um, you know, if, the, if, the elect if you've got solar panels on your roof at home and you park your Tesla and you charge it from the solar panels, well, fantastic. There's nothing coming out of the exhaust pipe of an electric car. But, um, you know, if, it's, if, if you're in Victoria and um, all of the electricity is coming from your lawn, from very, very poor quality lignite brown coal, um, that's not so good, is it? No. Gina has asked a very interesting question. Hypothetically, if you could grow an ideal lab-grown diamond crystal in order to cut the best diamond for optic performance, you could, what would it be that shape of that original crystal? Um, I went to a lecture in India um, about 15 years ago with the first American research-based organization that started um, growing diamonds for diamond cutting purposes. Can anybody think of the name of them? Um, uh, <clears throat> they eventually sold out to a Malaysian company and they're, they're, that Malaysian company is growing diamonds in Malaysia and Singapore now. Anyway, some of you will know who I'm talking about. Branko's um, asleep, I'm sure, so he would have been able to tell us. Um, they suggested that they would be able to grow bulls of diamonds um, that were preformed shape. So you would have um, a pavilion shaped or a cone shaped pavilion and um, presumably a round, round sides. Um, so <clears throat> whether that was just something that they were um, spinning as a yarn because they wanted venture capital, I don't know, but uh, that, that would be the perfect situation. You'd still have to facet it um, because you, you're not going to be able to grow it with a, you know, a nicely polished surface. Um, so, yeah. So would it have a depth of four mil approximately? Well, if it was a one carat stone, yeah, you'd have a 15% um, crown um, height, 16% crown height to allow for the girdle and 44% uh, and uh, pavilion depth and all you need to do is put your facets on. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to do any bruting. Uh, ELA Technologies, somebody has put in. Who? ELA Technologies. No, I don't two think a, so. Two A. Two A. I think they mean two A, as in diamond. Oh, a, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that sounds right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more. Uh, Bumika, I apologise if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, do you think that these CVD diamonds will change colour in 10 to 15 years? No, I don't think so. I'm not an expert, but I don't think so. It's crystalline, isn't it? It's, it's... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's all the questions. Excellent. So we'll end the poll. I've ended, ended the okay. poll and I'm going to share the results. People, I'm looking to the side because I've got another screen. Oh, it looks like I've convinced people that natural diamonds will be more expensive. I've convinced people that mobile phones are far more damaging for the environment. Um, and oh, I thought people would think that a diamond scan scanner was a scammer, but no, 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 it didn't trick very many people there. And what is the maximum depth percentage for a GA excellent cut? Yes, it's 63%. Um, that's correct. Um, in theory, it's correct. In practice, it isn't. Um, and um, if I did have more time, I had something to go on to, which would show you that there was a 64.9% pavilion depth diamond that was given GAA triple excellent. Um, what is the best GAA for? There is none. Yep, that's good. I'm amazed at how few people in the industry actually un do not understand that there is no grading system for fancy shaped diamonds from GIA. Anyway, that's me waffling on. What is a good diameter? Yep, 6.4 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
should I share how great the GA course of membership with my friends? Oh, definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks, even better, even better if they lower the, the, uh, the membership fees so that more people would um, stay on as members. And it would be even better if, we, to mute you, Gary. if we had a register of fellows. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a whole new discussion. So, <laughs> it is, isn't it? Uh, Gary, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You're so always so generous with your time. We really appreciate this, and it's a fabulous thing for members. If you haven't renewed your membership, please go to the bottom of that email I sent you, and there's your membership one if they haven't already sent you one from your state. Please do talk about the GAA. Uh, short courses are all more fun, and we'll be doing more online courses, fingers crossed, all goes well this year. Gary, any last final words? No, just thank you for everybody attending and um, I hope you got some value out of it. Thank you. Oh, we all did. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Sally, for being on. Really appreciate your help too. And good luck with all those short courses up in Queensland. Thank you. We're having great fun with them. All right. If anybody does want to revisit this webinar, you do need to just email me your email at publicity at gem.org.au. And I'd also like to hear um, what you would like to hear about next. We've got lots of exciting people coming up but we'd like to know what you want to hear about, what you want to learn about. Um, and maybe it's just a person you'd like to hear talk about if it's anything. It's the person or it's a subject. So either or, I'd really appreciate um, your input. We always love to hear from you. Okay, guys. Um, was it goodbye for me? Good night for me. And we look forward to seeing you in a month. Um, always the last Thursday of the month for our online webinars. Okay, thank you so much again, Gary. Thank you very much, Kate, thank you. Thanks thank you. for the free coupon. And don't forget, Gary's got two retail shops in Melbourne too. <laughs> you have the diamonds with the best bling. When we're thank allowed you. to travel to thank Melbourne, you, Sally. And come back to Queensland, I'll go visit. <laughs> and no, there's no free samples at Gary's shops. Oh, damn it, that was my next question. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Stay safe.